hello and welcome. I'm Fred Kemp. I'm president and CEO of the Atlantic Council, and I'd like to welcome you to Atlantic Council front page or hashtag AC front page, our premier live ideas platform for global leaders. Uh, today, we're honored uh, to host two extremely distinguished guests for a conversation about cultural resilience. I've really been looking forward to this one. Uh, this will be a conversation between uh, Lonnie G. Bunch III, the 14th Secretary of the Smithsonian, and Dr. Richard Curran, also of the Smithsonian. In one of my weekly inflection point newsletters from the summer of last year, I noted that the US ability and credibility to lead would rest on how effectively the country managed and learned from the triple shock of 2020. The worst global pandemic in a century, the deepest economic downturn since the Great Depression, and the most extensive racial upheavals in 50 years. But I also wrote that it's the third of those challenges that will prove to be the most difficult, decisive, and differentiating uh, preceded by centuries of history. Differentiating because in a world where most countries share the global challenge of COVID-19 and the recession, the nature and history of this third challenge is in its nature unique to the United States. And to work toward a more resilient future for our country, getting this challenge right is going to be crucial. These Smithsonian historians will explore the role of art in culture, social justice, diversity, equity, and inclusion. They will speak to the role of cultural resilience in the face of political, economic, and social disasters and upheavals. Today's event is hosted by the Atlantic Council's Adrian Arst Rockefeller Foundation Resilience Center, so capably led by its director, Kathy Buffman McLeod. She has a team that's working every day with the goal of making 1 billion people more resilient all around the world. This effort, of course, would not be possible without the vision and leadership of Adrian Arst. She's the executive vice chair of our board, uh, and she is the founder of the Adrian Arst uh, Rockefeller Foundation Center with the support of the Rockefeller Foundation. So Adrian, as always, it's just a deep pleasure uh, to pass to you to kick us off and introduce our special guest speakers. Thank you, Fred. And good morning, everyone. I'm really excited to be here to introduce these two distinguished speakers. Secretary Bunch is the 14th Secretary of the Smithsonian. He oversees 19 museums, 21 libraries, the National Zoo, and I'm sure there's a number of animals and insects I could have rattled off, but perhaps that changes biologically over time. Um, numerous research centers and education units in several cities. But what he is going to discuss today, well, I should say among other things, is the planning and the realization of the National Museum of American, African American History and Culture. It's really hard for me to realize that it was September 2016 that this museum opened. Um, perhaps for Lonnie, that, that seems like several centuries ago, but um, in that brief time, from then to now, more than six million people have visited that museum. And Lonnie has written about it in this book, A Fool's Errand, which I'm sure during the course of his working on it, he wondered about often. Joining Lonnie is my very dear friend, Richard Curran. He is distinguished scholar and ambassador at large at the Smithsonian. And I'm delighted to announce that as of now, Richard has joined the Adrian Arsh Rockefeller Foundation Resilience Center as a senior fellow. Being senior these days has new meaning. <laughs> I think it just means you can get the vaccine first. <clears throat> During Richard's 44-year career at the Smithsonian, he was acting provost. He was 
undersecretary overseeing, a phrase I really like, the institution's national museums, research centers. He has served on UNESCO juries and commissions and has made a lifetime of safeguarding our cultural heritage. It is within this context that I was particularly interested in having him be a part of the Resilient Center. And during all of this, Richard also has written several books. This one, I guess you can see, if you could think of 101 objects that define us. And now I will put my books away and turn this over to Secretary Bunch. Thank you so much. Richard and I are very excited about being here. Um, and this is an opportunity for me to publicly say just how much I admire Richard Kieran. Well, Lonnie, thank you so much. And, and uh, you know, it, it's Secretary Bunch, and I love the sweet sound of that. Lon, but <laughs> I'll, I'll call you Lonnie. Lonnie and I started working here four, almost five decades ago, and I never thought I'd hear those words, and I'm very proud to hear them. So uh, Lonnie and I are going to talk for a while about, uh, about our work uh, at, at the Smithsonian and beyond. Um, as Adrian said, great success. The National Museum of African American History and Culture certainly plays a role in our national reckoning on race and race relations today. But the same impulse was there over 100 years ago when, when that idea started. Lonnie, how did the idea for the museum take place? In some ways, there was a desire for African Americans to be recognized, to have their contribution to a nation be recognized. And in 1915, it was the 50th anniversary of the end of the Civil War, and there were many reunions of Yankees and rebels shaking hands, but nobody African American. So African American veterans of the Civil War said, it is our history that ought to be told on the National Mall. And that really began a process that took nearly 100 years and the goal was really simple, to say that African Americans made a major contribution to this country, and as a result of that, issues of equality and fairness should follow. So it didn't just flow naturally, right? They <laughs> formed a commission, it started, it stopped. Uh, it, it was really uh, uh, John Lewis, and, and, and talk about someone, an icon of the civil rights movement who, I, who exemplifies the very story of resilience. You work closely with John, John worked closely with you. It took a lot of effort on his part to, to see the museum. Why was it so important for John Lewis to see this through? I mean, I think it's, you know, to recognize that for 17 years, he introduced legislation to create this museum and it rarely, and it never passed. And finally in 2003, it was passed, signed by President Bush. Um, and he and I began working together in 2005. What is so powerful to me is first of all, he recognized that history was not about nostalgia. He wanted a museum that wasn't going to celebrate the civil rights movement, for example, but was going to help people understand that the struggle for racial justice has a long history. And he wanted the museum to be the foundation for the next generations, to use that history to keep challenging a country to live up to its stated ideals. What I'm amazed at is here is this person that um, was transformative, and yet he would check on me. How's things going with the museum? How can I help you? So this notion of John Lewis as both the great leader of the great conscience of a nation, but he was also somebody who, without his leadership and guidance, there would not have been a National Museum of African American History and Culture. So uh, as, as you suggest, these national institutions don't just happen. <laughs> <laughs> they take a lot of work. So, so when you were hired to be the director of the museum, Congress just handed you a few hundred million dollars. Yeah. The Smithsonian cleared out the bureaucracy, and everybody <laughs> said, "Hey, let's just do it." You had to face your own struggles, your own challenges to put this together, Lonnie. Well, as you know, we started with a staff of two. One of the staffers was one of your colleagues, Tasha Coleman, and that basically we had um, a Smithsonian that had people like Richard Curran who were very supportive, but others who worried that it might take resources from the Smithsonian. And in essence, it was a real struggle because Congress really didn't give the money, um, said you've got to come every year and ask for it, but also that we had to raise close to $300 million from the private sector. 
So the real challenge was, besides framing all of this, is really helping people to believe this was going to happen. Right? For 100 years, people have thrown around an idea, oh, there should be a museum, and it never happened. So the goal for me was to, yes, envision this as something special that is a contribution to the Smithsonian and to the nation, but also begin a process that allowed me to say this museum exists. It just doesn't have a building. And as you recall, Richard, you were so instrumental in allowing us to work with you and the Folk Life Center to be able to sort of do programs to demonstrate, here's what this museum is about, even if it doesn't have a building. Yeah. So in, in terms of weaving the whole thing together, which you had to do, you had a, a board, you have private members, you, had, you worked with Senate appropriators. I mean, I, I remember I just marveled because you, you did what I could not do, was put, oh. put together all, so it was like a dinner party. I mean, you were putting together, I, I, I mean, people who had all sorts of political positions but I think saw this as, as, as a common fight. I mean, I remember appropriation wise, you putting together uh, Senator Inouye and Fad Cochran from Mississippi. <laughs> you know, you, your board, you had business leaders and you had civil rights activists. What, what was it like putting, what did, did you feel that something the country was coming together over this because it needed that kind of effort to make it happen? You know, I think the timing was right. I think that the fact that Republican George Bush signed the legislation, really allowed me to frame this as a national story, not a Democratic story or a Republican story. And there were many people who were excited about being able to tell a history. Now, granted, there were a lot of different points of view. You know, some thought this should be a museum that was like a Holocaust museum of, you know, horrible stories. Others said to me, whatever you do, don't talk about slavery. Let's not give people sort of a negative sense of what this community's history is about. But what I found fascinating is that putting the museum together was really America at its best. There were all kinds of people who crossed racial lines, political lines to say, we need a way to help us remember. And I think for me, what was so powerful was recognizing that by framing the museum in a very different way. This was not a museum created by African-Americans for African-Americans. The goal was to say, let us use African-American culture as a lens to understand what it means to be an American. That in essence, this is your story too, regardless of how long you've been in this country, regardless of who you are, this is the story that has shaped us all. And I think that notion of bringing people together was really at the heart of the success of the museum. So as you say, you started out with a staff of two, no money, no building, and no collection. <laughs> and, and, and I know you were very moved. You did events all over the country where people had things that they had no place they had kept, maybe in their own act mm -hmm. of history making, of, of resilience, but found that this was the right repository. Uh, describe that for a moment, because you went all around the country talking to people about what they were pulling out of trunks and attics and basements and things. That's really the key. You know, there were discussions about whether or not the Smithsonian should collect. Um, should this be a museum driven by technology? But I knew from our time there that, you know, people want to see the right flyer, the ruby slipper, the Greensboro lunch counter, many of the objects you talked about in your book. And so I knew we had to find things and I feel, believe that so much of history was still in basements, trunks, and people's homes. So what we did is we stole the idea from Antique Roadshow. We went around the country and we said, bring out your stuff. Now, we didn't value it. We said, we're going to help you preserve grandma's old shawl, that 19th century photograph. And then people would start bringing things out. And they would sort of, you know, in Chicago, in New York, in Phoenix, and they would bring material out and we'd suddenly say, oh my goodness, that is really amazing. Because in some ways, the public, especially the African-American community, but the public generally, was keeping these treasures, these collections, these artifacts, recognized they were important, sometimes to them, but basically we were able to tap into that commitment, that desire to say the story of Madam C.J. Walker and building a business was important, or the story of an agricultural person who was a farmer for 40 years was important. So basically what we really were able to do was to get the country to care by giving their artifacts. And so many things that we received were just amazing that were really transformative, whether it's 
Chuck Berry's Candy Apple Red Cadillac and the guitars that he wrote songs on, or, or material from Harriet Tubman that a collector in Philadelphia had for us and brought that out and allowed me to cry and believe that we could find this amazing stuff that was under people's beds. So as you were doing this and building the museum and raising the money, uh, events uh, in Ferguson, Missouri exploded onto the national scene and really opened up uh, the, you know, many issues uh, of racial justice in, in our, our, our country. Not that they hadn't been there before, but it really made people, I think, quite aware of it. So you saw the museum could play a contemporary role in terms of- I thought it was important to realize- pushback? Did you ever get pushback from the administration of the Smithsonian on this? Uh, let's just say that I'm not smart enough to know what I can't do. Um, and sometimes I, I can't hear. Um, so there was a lot of concern about, you know, should this be a museum that looked back rather than a museum that talked about today and tomorrow? But I thought that was really the key, that it had to be more than a traditional museum. It had to be a place that would allow the public to contextualize contemporary issues. It had to be a place that would collect Ferguson and you know, the murder of Freddie Gray in Baltimore and Confederate monuments. It had to be a place that was what would help the public find tools to grapple with the challenge of race, which I think is one of the great chasms in this country. So um, part of the reason we were successful candidly is that not everybody believed we could pull this off. So sometimes we flew under the radar. It was support from people like you that helped, helped us get the Smithsonian involved and excited. But in essence, the goal was to say, if this is quote, just a museum, we failed. But if it's a symbol of possibility, a symbol of remembrance, a symbol of reconciliation and healing, then we played the role that we needed to do. And I think in a practical matter, I remember we had uh, uh, members of police forces in training. The museum was, a, I mean, the museum is a training ground for law enforcement to deal with people in a respectful way. I mean, where do you put that in museology? <laughs> You're right. I mean, the notion was, what should we be that could be a value, that could help? And helping to train police officers, National Guard. I think the goal is the Smithsonian is a place people trust, and we wanted to use that trust to help make a country better. But in some ways, Richard, that's really what you've done throughout your entire career. You have spent your career helping a country be made better. And I wonder, as I think a lot about how you've helped people and helped this country grapple with change. Um, you've been one of the pioneers to do that through your work, to make your work meaningful and not just to a small community. What the work you did with the Folk Life program was just amazing. What was it that allowed you to take that program in very different ways and really make it something that mattered both to local communities, but also to international communities? Yeah, it, it, you know, it's a good question. I'm a, I'm a New York City kid, but I went to uh, India as a uh, undergraduate and then got into anthropology. And I, you know, lived in villages in India and Pakistan. And I saw, you know, people who were living their life who were, were intelligent, who had wisdom, who had contributions to make the world, and yet seemed to be marginalized. You know, their voices and their ability to contribute to the world was very limited. And so I, I, you know, I kind of started seeing culture as a almost like a human rights issue and representation as a voice issue, just as you've, you know, talked about those veterans in 1915, you know, who wanted the dignity and respect of what they'd done, and also wanted to have the chance to communicate that so other people would know about that. So when I came to the Smithsonian, I thought it was less about what we put in the museum, and what we were doing for the world, and if we could help people. If we could help people and give foster respect and dignity and understanding and learning, then we can contribute to a larger human cultural and civic dialogue. I mean, that commitment to respect um, and also to diversify our understanding globally of who we are as a people and as a nation was really powerful. And I remember very much you and I having long conversations in 2005 about the impact of Hurricane Katrina. I remember that you and I talked a long time about what does this mean? What role the Smithsonian can play? And you saw more than anybody else that we could do more with, with helping 
as a result of Katrina. Could you talk about what you envisioned and how did that sort of amplify or change some of the things you wanted to try to accomplish? Well, you remember that time we were conspirators because uh, <laughs> one of your predecessors uh, uh, didn't want to react. You know, New Orleans is a font of American history and culture. I mean, look what it created in terms of the melange of people and traditions from, you know, music and history and narrative and food and everything else in architecture. And they were beset by Hurricane Katrina. And I thought with all those archives and museums and collections and the living culture of New Orleans, there was something we could do. And the Smithsonian had affiliate museums and organizations there. And we had a leader at that time in the Smithsonian said, what do I care about that? Right. And I think both you and I have a sense that, you know, the museums may represent culture, they may help us forward it, but, but it really exists and lives among people who carry it, who sing the songs, who have the traditions. And so after Hurricane Katrina, the idea was to, to, to try to do something to help save collections, to give gigs to musicians, to help the living culture, to do craft sales and things like that. What can we do to help people in their hour of direst need so that culture is not lost? And I think one of the things that you did so powerfully at that moment and later, but even at that moment, one of the things you came up with was, let us bring the living culture to the mall Let's remind people of what is lost if we don't save and help help the people of New Orleans survive this moment. And I have to be honest with you, so much of what you've done has really inspired me. And for me, one of the things that I think is just so powerful has been your recognition that the Smithsonian needs to play a role in helping places that are in stress, whether it's because of war or because of natural disaster. I, mean, I was really struck by um, what you did in Haiti after the earthquake, what you thought about how do you help with the hurricanes in Puerto Rico. In some ways, could you talk a little bit about your vision of how the Smithsonian should play that kind of role? What were the challenges? Because I mean, not everybody thought that Smithsonian should be in Haiti or in Puerto Rico. Yeah, well, I think for one, it's, you know, recognizing the underlying culture that en enables people to survive and flourish. You know, if you don't have respect for the culture, you're not. And if you just see, you know, our response or humanitarian responses as a handout, it's a very different thing. But if you see people taking part in their own cultural recovery and their own resilience to disaster, that's where it is. You know, that, 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 that's where the strength was. And, you know, you and I know as, you know, historians, cultural historians, the role that cultures played in Haiti and giving people a strength of identity. I mean, during that earthquake, it was devastation. 200,000 people died in Haiti. And, and, and the Haitians somehow were able to survive and pull through with nothing. Yes, there was aid, there was help, but it was really in Haitian hands because people were proud of what they did in the past. They, were, they drew on their own strength. You cannot survive if you don't draw on that strength within you. And that strength was rooted in a culture and history of who they were. And, and, and so I felt we needed to encourage that. We had to talk a lot of people into it. <laughs> uh, the, the idea of culture as humanitarian aid is not necessarily felt, but it was something the Smithsonian could do. We're good at that. We're expert at that. And I was inspired by Corey Wegner, who's now at the Smithsonian. She was a monuments woman. She helped save the museum in Iraq uh, after the US invasion. And I relied on her and a good people in the army, uh, people at the, the State Department, at voluntary organizations, conservators. Heck, we sent about 80 people from the Smithsonian down to Haiti to work with Haitians to help save their cultural heritage. And we saved churches and sculptures and artworks and libraries and archives. So Haitians would have the, the, the tools, the cultural DNA to recraft their future for recovery. And I think that was important too. And in Puerto Rico, after their hurricane, we saved that museum collections, 500 years of Puerto Rican culture, heritage, and identity that would have been gone had not we provided some fuel for a generator to keep the air conditioning going so stuff wouldn't get uh, moldy. So uh, we've done that all over. We've done that in the U.S. with floods in the Midwest and floods in Texas where we've helped people save their family treasures and disasters, that family album, grandma's quilt, Mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the Bible that the families kept, because that gives people the will to go on. Those are the touchstones of who we are. But I think that's what's so powerful about what you've done, 
it is both preserving culture, but not preserving culture in a frozen sense, but preserving culture that allows people to dip into that reservoir, to believe that change is possible, to believe that they can survive. I mean, I think that's what's so important. And what you've done is you have really elevated in the eyes of so many um, what culture really does in terms of as a survival mechanism. And I think that's really very powerful. And I've just been struck by the work that you and Corey did um, in Iraq, especially working in the wake of ISIS. And you might talk a little bit about that and, and how what your work you've done has been important in that nation's recovery. Yeah, so we have a number of people. Jesse Johnson has worked for years in Erbil, training Iraqis to recover their cultural heritage. Here you have one of the seats of you know human civilization, Mesopotamia, right? The the Fertile Crescent, and 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 thousands of years of history and culture, uh, uh, and and the idea that ISIS was trying to wipe that away, and and. You know, ISIS was showing the power of that kind of terrorism. If I could wipe away people's identity, people's culture, we've seen that before. Look, we saw that in Africa yep. in terms of colonialism. We saw that in terms of Nazi Europe. Let me wipe away Jewish identity. We've seen it all over the place. It becomes a fundamental tactic of, of war. And it, it's a terrible tactic of war. And so the idea of the Smithsonian help people to, to hold on to, recapture their identity, their history, with all its warts. As, as Lonnie Bunch says, the unvarnished history. You know, <laughs> it's not like we're aggrandizing the, 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 the rule of Assyrian kings or something, but it's important to understand it and know it, know where we've been and know how we can face. It's also an economic and civic consequence That's, because, mm -hmm. you know, look, uh, cultural tourism, museums, archaeological sites, these things are important in terms of the lifeblood in the economy of a region. And if we don't help save that culture, there's a lot of people that won't have jobs in the future. So it goes to their civic identity, their ethnic and, and, and cultural and religious identity, but it also goes to the kind of cultural economics of saving cultural heritage as a way for uh, people's livelihoods. So in a way, I mean, what you've really done is framed a multi task way to think about how does culture help? How do we protect? How do we encourage? How does culture drive the economic growth? And I guess as I think about um, what the Smithsonian should do in the future, as I think about the work you've done um, in terms of nationally and internationally in terms of cultural and cultural heritage, what do you think are the big challenges we face now? What, what worries you and what are the things that I, as secretary, should be paying more attention to. Yeah, well, it's kind of not unlike the battle of, you know, one is funding. So we've been lucky. There's a new international foundation, Aleph, that got formed as a result of actually the building of the Louvre Abu Dhabi. So France and UAE and now others have come on. It's a huge fund to help support cultural heritage and danger. So the money's falling into place. As we know, Bank of America has been great support. Mellon and others who recognize the value of culture, cultural heritage and supporting it. So money is one thing. Politics is another. And we've seen those partnerships develop uh, uh, under the Obama administration. They passed the uh, preserve and protect cultural property right. That's created a one governmental approach, also allied with NGOs, to help save cultural heritage. So we have the legal authority to act. That's very important. At home, the Smithsonian's formed a partnership with FEMA. Mm -hmm. So when there's an emergency, we deal with it not only as a, as a crisis in infrastructure, but as a cultural crisis as well that we can respond. And then I think there's a marvelous network of researchers and cultural workers and conservators that the Smithsonian has helped weave together. So there's much more consciousness of the problem, of the issue and how it has to be. And we face increasing conflicts where culture is an item of war. We face climate change where we have more disasters and more severe disasters. And, and that's even a slow moving disaster mm -hmm. <laughs> as we get mm -hmm. changes affecting the ability to keep our libraries, museums, archives, and cultural sites open. So we got a full plate, Lonnie, ahead of us. I don't know, with all this gray for both of us, we got plenty of work to do. Well, I think before we open up to questions, I think the key is to basically, for me to let you know, I really think that you have pioneered so much and you have saved culture, but you have really helped the Smithsonian recognize what's the greater good we should play? And so I want to just thank you, Richard, for really that kind of leadership. 
Well, and Lonnie, that's what you're doing as secretary. And I think all of us are, are firmly behind you because I think you've articulated more than any other secretary in history, the, the promise of the Smithsonian, the increase in diffusion of knowledge among all, among all, everybody, knowledge from everybody, and really, I think, for the ultimate, for the public good of our society and the planet. So, uh, so uh, anyway, we're in it together, brother. You and me. And thank, thank you. you. Thank you for this visit, this, this time. And Kathy, let me turn it back to you because Richard and I can talk for another two hours. That's exactly what we want you to do. Uh, but <laughs> we do have a little bit of a time a time constraint. So um, thank you, Secretary Bunch, and to you, Richard, uh, for this uh, you know uh, amazing conversation. I think amazing gets overused. I don't think that's the case here. Really, um, just uh, stunning and a look into um, what you do and how you do it and what it means and and the resilience of both of you is uh, on full display. Um, so we're going to take questions now from from the uh, Zoom section. We've got some questions that are coming in from. Um, Twitter. I want to start with a question from Kim Austin. Um, Kim is asking, being that we are still making history every day and knowing that the U.S. still has much to do for the African-American community, where might there be room for expansion for the museum and um, in the coming decades as we see that history unfolding, or maybe centuries even? I, I think it's important to realize that the role of a museum is to not just look back, but it's to collect today for tomorrow. And it's also to contextualize the current moment. So one of the things we did is we created a rapid response team so that when there are issues that were important, um, recently we collected the insurrection on January 6th. So the key is to make sure first and foremost that unlike early in my career as a curator, there were stories I wanted to tell and there were no collections. I wanna make sure that that is preserved. But then to recognize that what's important, and I think what the African American Museum does, is says, this is a story that shapes everyone, so therefore all parts of the Smithsonian should embrace the story. So it doesn't have to be, you don't need to build another African American Museum. What you need to do is make sure those issues permeate from the Smithsonian Art Museum um, to the National Union of the American Indian. And so I think that's the great joy of the Smithsonian, is that we give people different lenses different doors into understanding what it means to be an American. Beautiful. Oh, that makes perfect sense. Uh, next question, one for each of you from Ellen McCullough Lovell. Hi, Richard. How did you Hi, find, Ellen. <laughs> how did you find the funds to help Haitians, Puerto Ricans, and Iraqis save their culture? And to you, Lonnie, how much did the government um, provide for the museum in relation to how much you had to raise? Go ahead, Lonnie, are, yeah, go ahead. You take the first one. Now. All right. Well, you know, the notion was that it was supposed to be a 50-50 split. Um, but in essence, what happened is there was no mechanism that said, if you raise X, the government will give you Y. There was no mechanism to say, but you also have to ra raise money to bring staff on. So in essence, I always argue that we raised sort of close to $700 million, some from the federal government, a lot from the private sector, um, to really make this work. And I think that was one of the great strengths of being part of the Smithsonian, because being part of the Smithsonian gave us a way in. People trusted us and to be able to build the museum and get the money that we needed to do it. Yeah, and Ellen, it's good to hear from you. I know Ellen well, we work together. So you'll be happy to hear that uh, in terms of the Haiti money, uh, what was key was the President's Committee for the Arts and Humanities. Uh, that came forth and really wanted to do that program. But, you know, getting government money is always a long haul. Uh, the Haiti relief package came in August 2011, 19 months after the hurricane, wouldn't have done much good. Uh, but uh, on that committee, on the president's committee was a woman named Margot Lyon, who's co-chair, Broadway producer, now sadly deceased. She got the Broadway League to give money for Haiti, private money. And why did they give the money to Haiti? because New York and Broadway had gone through 9-11. And they knew the importance of getting Broadway up after 9-11 to show that New Yorkers were alive and culture was alive. And they made the connection, I was proud as a New Yorker, they made the connection that for Haiti, their earthquake was equivalent to 9-11 in New York. 
and getting culture up and running again was so important for the lifeblood of the society. So the Broadway League anted up a few hundred thousand dollars, and uh, and then we found good support in uh, in Congress and in uh, USAID and among other things, and then a bunch of private contributors, and we put together a you know a, a package that really enabled us to do that over a period of two or three years, about five million dollars in the end. Stunning, stunning. Oh, thank you. So next question comes from uh, Katie Densmore. She says the recent insurrection at the Capitol and the law enforcement response that was so different from what we saw in many of the BLM protests. Uh, she wants to know how you think we should look at our cultural resilience and recovery in the face of that recent crisis. Secretary well, Bunch. I think what it really reminds us is that we're still in the midst of a cultural war. Um, we're still in the midst of a fundamental debate over what America is. Is America the nation that is a work in progress that is really striving to live up to its stated ideals? Or is America a place that is looking back to a past that really never existed? A past, however, that was not, was not free or of discrimination, a past that really wasn't uh, ripe with equality. I think that in a way, what this has told us is that it is time for all Americans to contribute to this discussion. Um, to challenge America to live up to its ideals. I think what Black Lives Matters tells us is that the struggle to change America is not a struggle that happens overnight. It's a struggle that builds on generations of activity. And so I would be, I believe strongly that the challenge of race in this country will always be with us and that it's really going to be an ongoing struggle. Um, as long as as an America, there'll be the challenge of fairness and finding a way to understand how race brings us together and not simply separates us. Yeah, and Kathy, if I could add to that, I mean, that, you know, that goes, uh, you know, take what Lonnie said about, you know, the collecting for the African American Museum. There was no collection. There was a lack of recognition and representation. Uh, we saw that too with women's history. You know, you go back before 19... Talk about issues of Latino culture and others, you know, through the through yeah. the country. And so there's a challenge. So the idea is our institutions, you know, you can have that reckoning in a moment, but you need to build within an institution the preparedness, the resilience, the, the resources. So now we have, you know, dozens of curators that are that are concentrating on issues that need representation. And their work today will help us better represent all sorts of stories and all sorts of contributions tomorrow. Absolutely. It's hard not to think of Amanda Gorman's words that says that America is not broken, but unfinished. And I, yeah. um, that's apt, yeah. Uh, so we have a question that is, you've just touched on it, Richard, uh, from Frank Gomez. How does the experience of the planned Latino museum parallel that of the African American museum? And I, I think you've, you've likely answered it, but I wanted to note the question because the audience is going in the same direction that you are. But if you want to say a, a few more words, please do. I think it's important that, look, the Smithsonian is one of the few places where millions of people will come to grapple with a question, a subject that they won't do in their hometown. So it's really important to have mm -hmm. museums like the Latino Museum or the forthcoming Women's History Museum. And I think the challenge is to make sure that it's really a two-sided coin. That one side is um, a museum that is richly um, enveloped in a culture. So that the story that is told is a story that those that know see themselves, get excited about it. But I would argue the challenge of today is to make sure the second side of that coin is to say, how does looking through that culture tell us about who we are as Americans? In other words, one of the things that we tried to do with the African American Museum was to be, to revel in our blackness, but to claim our Americanness. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think will happen with these other museums as we move forward. Yeah. And I should say, Ed, it doesn't mean that we're going to take all the portraits of women out of the National Portrait Gallery. <laughs> Right, you would never do that, or you're you're not going to take Ellen Ochoa's, you know, uh, you know, uh, material out of there in Space Museum. You know, the idea is that there is those two sides of the coin, and the Smithsonian has to be a, a, a wonderful place where those those do come together. And what you want is to recognize that there are very few places that have different ways into that subject. 
which is why Richard's absolutely right. You want to make sure that you can come to a culture in the Smithsonian Art Museum, as well as the National Museum of the American Indian, for example. So that's the wonder of the Smithsonian, is that we give you many ways in to understanding who you are as a community and who you are as a nation. Well, I will say that there are many questions that have come in that have the same theme. And perhaps last question I'll pose to both of you is, how do um, you see the role of the museums of the Smithsonian in bringing unity after what we saw on uh, January 6th and where we are right now as a, as a country? I really feel that museums, not just the Smithsonian, museums globally need to embrace their social justice role. In many ways, as Richard's framed it, culture, the culture through the lens of museum, are, that's the glue that holds a nation together. It's the glue that house, allows a nation to bump against each other, to debate, to fight, to push. But it's also the glue that allows us to find understanding. So I feel very strongly that museums have to recognize that if they don't have a contemporary resonance, then they're about nostalgia. Um, and I really do believe that museums, like all of us at a time of crisis, need to find ways to help make a country better, need to find ways to demonstrate that we are of value. So for me, places like the Smithsonian are as much about today and tomorrow as they are about yesterday. Beautiful. Richard. Nothing more to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's that's a quotable, beautiful. Uh, I, and I have to read, this is not a question, but a comment. And um, just the humanity of today's discussion is uh, quite moving. And this uh, comment from Lorraine um, Mangones, and she says, I um, mean, it may be Manjon, I'm not sure. Uh, she says, not a question, just words of profound thanks to the amazing Richard Curran. In Haiti, we will never forget that he was among the first to come to our rescue. And we connected immediately on the essential role of culture in our survival process. So just wanted to share that with you, Richard. There are others, it's really, we'll, we'll share this with you, but lots of thanks to you both in the questions um, for what you are doing to um, bring us together, to bring the resilience of culture and humanity um, into the everyday conversations and that idea of the contemporary versus the uh, nostalgia is so important. So I will close us out by saying how incredibly excited we are to have Dr. Kieran Richard as our senior fellow at the Adrian R. Rockefeller Foundation Resilience Center and to align our work that's so um, on display, as I said today, in the resilience of our culture and we are bringing resilience to individuals and all of this folds together as we face the multiple crises that we face today and not just uh, survive but thrive. And so let me also say thank you to Adrian Arsht, um, our forever inspiration and our um, gratitude um, every day for what you bring for us to be able to do this work. Um, a special thank you to the Rockefeller Foundation for their support also, and to Fred Kemp for his leadership and for um, the ability to have these conversations that are so important right now. Uh, thank you for joining today's event. We are, oh, Richard? Yeah, Ken, I just wanted to say, in case there's any confusion, I still work for Lonnie. Oh, yes, it's a, it is the um, avocational. <laughs> yeah, that, yes. My day, my day job is still at the Smithsonian. So yes. I'm, glad to, I'm really glad to be at the Atlantic Council <laughs> and contributing to the you know debate and presentation. But yes. uh, Lonnie's still signing my paycheck. So. <laughs> I just sent him an email saying, hey, you still with me? So thanks for clarifying that. <laughs> we'll uh, rephrase next time, Richard. <laughs> okay, we'll get those business cards printed immediately. <laughs> thank you for the clarification. Um, so let me close by saying thank you for joining us um, at today's front page event. Um, our next event is um, on uh, February 2nd on Tuesday, uh, featuring French President Emmanuel Macron. A uh, conversation with my colleague Ben Haddad, who runs our Future Europe Initiative. And um, you can always interact with us at the Adrian Arsh Rockefeller Foundation Resilience Center on Twitter at, at @arshrock and with the Atlantic Council by tagging at Atlantic Council. So thank you all very much for joining us today, and we look forward to seeing you at our next event. Bye-bye.